I love it. It's one of my favorite festivals. There's just an excitement here. This is one of the festivals really can feel the atmosphere. This is a war feeling. I love being in front of a crowd like this. A lot of passionate people. People that turn up here really want to see the bands. They're fans of music. It's all about metal. It's true metal hands coming here, which I love. You have yeah. to come. If you've never been here, you have to come here. In 2001, Paul Raymond Gregory and a small group of friends started the Bloodstock Festival in the heart of England. I have had the feeling that um, this was a festival founded by friends. Uh, certainly from day one, a family-run affair. Obviously, the family has now extended to encapsulate more than just the, the bloodline. <laughs> the Gregories are the, probably the saviors of English metal yeah. festivals, aren't they? First met Paul, it was just walking around. You know, no idea this was the guy behind it all. Paul is also an artist a master of conjuring fantasy and imagination with oil paint on canvas. The first year we played, 2007, I didn't know nothing about Bloodstock. I didn't, I didn't have a clue what it was about. Somebody just said to me, oh, that's Paul Raymond Gregory, the guy that does all the Tolkien artwork. My name's Paul Gregory. I'm an artist and promoter. I was born in Derby. Father was a builder, mother stayed at home, that sort of thing, you know. But we weren't a wealthy, by any stretch of the imagination, it was, you know, quite poor. I think as a child, he was, he was brought up in an era in this country where, you know, it was kind of just after the war. He was brought up in an environment where the family were very, very poor. You know, you'd got sort of 12 kids living in the same house and all the relatives and which is fine because you don't know any different that's the norm i would say when i was probably i don't know 12 or something like that i was really starting getting into horror movies and that's pretty much where, where the fantasy side for me started he he did at that time a lot of pen and ink drawings, a lot of um, pencil drawings. He, he started doing, doing a lot of landscape paintings where he would go out perhaps for a day in the fields in Derbyshire and the poppy fields. He always had a great imagination and he wanted to develop it more. If you want to paint a landscape, to make it look like a, a landscape, you need to understand how a landscape works. You know, you need to look at the depth, you know, perspective. If you want to create fantasy, you want to make it as real as you can, it has to have some basis in fact. And so for me, you know, I needed to learn how to paint a landscape. For as long as I can remember, my father has always painted. He'd be up seven in the morning, um, right until the daylight would go, three in the afternoon. All his uh, life, seven days a week, was painting, music, metal. Certain music reflected his mood at that time, and that came out in his paintings. So, you know, there, there was some very bluesy music that he'd be playing, and this, his paint, some of his paintings would be very dark. Uh, well, I'm most comfortable uh, in my studio with the music on, Occasional coffee, 
working on the, whatever canvas it is. No, we were barred from the studio. Well, I wasn't allowed in anyway, because I think I was too disruptive. I'd pick pens up and draw on things. So he probably didn't want my artistic um, stamp on his artwork uh, at that time. It was brilliant childhood, because we had a lot of brothers and sisters, and we were all very, very close family. Making a living was very hard. You know, he, he sort of took a secondary job as a carpet fitter. My mum had to go, obviously, to work, because his painting just simply didn't finance a family with four children. I feel the need to be free to create. Painting is the, is the biggest thing for me, but I like the challenges of other things as well in business. When I decided to take on a gallery, I bought two 200-year-old cottages. It was due for demolition. And I went to the council and said, look, you know, I want to change it into a, into a gallery. We had very little money and uh, had to live in a caravan while it was being built because that was the cheapest option for us. It was one of the worst winters ever. I remember trying to open the caravan door and you know, the snow was up to it, you know, like, absolutely crazy. So my kids have been brought up by my insanity. We ended up spending one of the coldest winters ever on record in the UK in a little flimsy caravan in the back garden. That's why they were actually sort of, you know, building this, this you know, lovely gallery as it was then. We knew that the gallery would be obviously our living. It's something he, he always wanted to do, to have our own gallery. So obviously, you know, you have to make sacrifices and that's the sacrifice we made. You know, my wife at the time, Penny, you know, she didn't um, see it anything other than a, you know, a challenge and a place to be, you know, going forward. And I was backing him all the way because obviously I wanted him to have, you know, his own uh, studio. And we also wanted to start exhibiting other artists at the gallery as well, which we did. We, we started with David Shepherd, the wildlife artist. I think we uh, had about 15,500 people in four weeks, which is a high turnover. It paid off tremendously. And that's when I decided I wanted to create my own work. And that's when I decided to, uh, to start on the, the Tolkien stuff. The first painting was completed, I think, in 1978, at Ride of the Rohirrim. That was a 10-foot by 6-foot canvas. So big, anyway, huge canvas, yeah. Being a fan of landscape and Tolkien's world is all very sort of descriptive. Um, to me, it was a, a natural flow from one to the other, you know. He was inspired by reading the books, without a doubt, and he conjured up so much imagination that he had to put it onto canvas. He wanted to do things more sort of intricate and, and mind-boggling, and that's what he's done. Most people um, see a painting on the, on the website. They don't realise how large some of these paintings are, and some of them are absolutely huge, enormous great things. And you watch the look on someone's face when they walk in, they're confronted with a painting the size of, like, one wall, you know, and they're thinking, oh, my God, well, yeah, how long did it take you to do that? I wanted to create something that was quite unique, you know, and that's why the size of the paintings are as they are, you know. The source of the Anduin, it's got a beautiful scene of mountains in the background and a river snaking away across the middle ground of the painting, a beautiful sky, the, the light especially is caught in that painting beautifully. And there are two or three little figures in the middle uh, around a campfire. You don't know who they are, but one can assume that they might have been, say, some wizards or perhaps some rangers or whatever. And that's the great thing with Paul is that he doesn't paint a particular scene out of Tolkien's works. He paints something that's been inspired by Tolkien's works. I mean, there's one canvas, and the 61 paintings are one canvas. And each chapter from Lord of the Rings is on this canvas. It's absolutely awesome. But it got to a situation where um, we had too many exhibitions. Um, Paul couldn't concentrate on the larger paintings that were now 10 foot by 6 foot. We had triptychs. Uh, so we decided that uh, perhaps we'd sell the gallery and uh, move somewhere else where he could concentrate on, you know, larger paintings. But once you step over that mark um, and, and you give up your job and, and you're relying on your work, then that obviously is a hell of a strain. Uh, 
I, I do really have a very soft spot for Grand. And you see, because I knew this picture before you know it. I knew this picture when there was a sort of gap in Paul's production. And this picture was a load of squiggly lines and everything, and it was wonderful. It was half painted and half a sketch, and it was really wonderful. And then one day, you know, it becomes the painting it is today, which is also wonderful. And it's, there's a huge energy in it, and that huge energy exploding out of the picture towards you. All these people, you know, it's a 3D action picture. You know, I'm interested in people's guts. And this is, this is not just the artist, but the framer. They've given everything. And that's why it's fantastic. And it's only at certain points in time in your life when you can give everything. I'm, I'm astounded, really, you know. I'm astounded when I look at it. I think it's fantastic. It wasn't till later that he got um, Peter Nahum, who was his art dealer, who basically saw his work and was completely blown away. And, you know, Peter's been an art dealer with some of the biggest artists that have ever lived. And he saw Paul's work and said, I will commission you to do paintings. We will together put together a host of paintings and have a gallery and have an exhibition. We'll get these works of art out there. Peter owns most of my, most of my work now, yeah. If it hadn't have been for Peter, they, they wouldn't have been a collection. And that, to me, is, was my original aim. And to try and keep the paintings together, for me, was a, a great idea. But in reality, it just wasn't going to happen financially. So I needed somebody else on board to make that work. We started buying his pictures because they were extraordinary and they were these great things. I'd been at Sotheby's for 17 years and I'd run the Victorian painting department. My thrust is offbeat. I don't like pretty obvious pictures because pretty obvious pictures like a lot of impressionist pictures and those sort of things. They're very lovely but they become wallpaper. You just you don't notice them after a while. You need, some, you need more than that to feed you from an image. Peter and Hume kind of um, supported him financially to allow him to paint and express without the pressure of finance or not having any finance, which helps him massively. So I devised an exhibition run where we had the exhibition in London and then it went to every Sotheby's office around England and it ended up in Edinburgh in August at the Edinburgh Festival. You know, life is a drudge, really. Most of life is a drudge, and some people escape that drudgery, if they can, through fantasy. So my job was to make his fantastic vision really work. In other words, draw people in through the frames into the fantasy, but at the same time, not allow those frames to overpower the pictures. And that journey I went on with John Davis, who has this extraordinary carving workshop. He had a vision in himself to want to create the frames around them, to make them spectacular and part of the painting, which he did, which is, you know, awesome to do that. I think, I think no, they, they enhanced the paintings dramatically. I'm pretty sure that Tolkien would have been very impressed with some of Paul's work, especially the large-scale ones, because you couldn't help but be impressed with those. I'm pretty sure that the idea of marrying them with these frames would have, been, would have intrigued him as well. With the help of Peter Nahum, Paul's artwork received exposure across Europe and the United Kingdom. In 1984, the legendary heavy metal band Saxon took notice. One of my Tolkien paintings uh, was seen by Saxon's manager. Uh, Saxon at the time wanted to change from the type of covers they had to something, you know, uh, three-dimensional or something, you know, that was art as opposed to a design. And that's how it started. At the very day that Biff and Saxon turned up at the house, I said, like, oh, his rock stars here wearing tight jeans and long hair and... Well, I got invited up to see him in Derby. And, um, yeah, it's the first time we worked with Paul on um, Crusader. You know, we talked about the song and, um, and what it was about. So, you know, that, that's what he took away and um, we came back with the, with the Crusader. 
painting. I mean, I got a phone call saying you had to come and look at it. It's nearly finished. And, uh, you know, and I expected to see something like, you know, about a, a foot, something like this, you know, an album cover size. And uh, walked in the studio and, um, you know, it was huge. It was absolutely unbelievable to see it, oil painting. And um, I was sold on it straight away. It's just an iconic image, really. You know, we went back to him on quite a few albums, actually. Visually, he came up with uh, covers that, that went with my lyrics. Since Crusader, Paul has created artwork for nearly all of Saxon's album covers. You know, he does love the band and um, he loves the music and um, he likes doing our covers. And he'll always be there to do our covers, really. He is a very close friend of the band and we do trust him. After he met with Saxon, he got really heavily into a lot more of the music. The album covers was just a passion because I love the music. Uh, and they come like buses, you know, like three at a time or none at all. Paul's work with Saxon soon had bands from around the world seeking his unique art style for their album covers. We didn't really meet Paul, like, you know, face to face, but I spoke with him on the telephone when we were in the middle of the Devil's Canyon record. Paul was able to, just from the way I was describing the music, he was able to take that and came out with a definitive album cover for Devil's Canyon. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. I said, this is just too much, right? Like Saxon, Molly Hatchett found Paul's epic art style to be the perfect fit for their sound and have used his artwork on the majority of their records. There always has to be um, a very close link in between the music of an album and um, its package. I checked out uh, Paul's homepage and found out his passion for Tolkien. And so I was convinced he would be the right person for our next album. I contacted him uh, on the phone, and since he is a great metal fan, he had a good idea about Blind Guardian, and he was willing to do the job. So we exchanged ideas, and after a while, he came up with a fantastic concept and a fantastic painting of A Night at the Opera. It was a great privilege for me to do that. It was such a departure from their normal artwork. We had some more humoristic ideas and we wanted something more uplifting. And um, I mentioned that to Paul and um, he delivered this in his very special way. The nice thing about doing album covers for me is it, it allows me to do something I wouldn't normally do. It takes you down a road that, you know, a path you wouldn't normally take as a painter, you know. This new path would lead Paul to create album covers for a multitude of different bands. It also gave him the chance to explore new fantasy genres, such as science fiction and horror. He did the awakening. It's a demonic beast kind of lurching over a, a, a cross in a, in a graveyard. It's brilliant. Texturally, it looks amazing. I mean, you know, to be, to be rocking up there with the same artist that did Molly Hatchet, that did Dio, that did, you know, Company of Snakes, etc., and, you know, Blind Guardian. It's, it's, it's a great honor. And, you know, he's a top man. He really is. The link between fantasy and metal music in general is based in the melodic elements of the music. And I think that the music, no matter which band we're talking about, is creating pictures, images. And you, as an artist, uh, would love to have something which stays timeless. The fantasy genre and metal music have always gone hand in hand. Bands like Amon Amarth, whose name is a reference to Lord of the Rings, know this all too well. I think when it comes to metal, metalheads, you know, we like, we like to have fun and portray ourselves as like, be these fucking wild asses. But I actually think that metalheads are kind of smart. They like to read up on stuff. And I think fantasy is something that can intrigue a lot of people. And I, I can see why you would find a lot of inspiration in, in fantasy novels and, and fantasy art, for that matter, you know. 
rock and roll and heavy metal are just set up for that kind of escape, perfect getaway. When you go to a concert, when you pierce your ear for the first time and you put on a leather jacket with spikes and you paint your favorite band's logos on the back, and, and the crazier imagery, the better, you know, because these kids want to escape from reality. They want to get away from their parents and school, and they feel like the world's against them. Rock and roll music goes hand in hand with escapism. Working closely with bands gave Paul a new appreciation for rock and metal music. This would inspire his most ambitious project yet. Well, here we are at Catton Hall, uh, which is right the south of Derbyshire, and we're here in the beautiful countryside, which is going to be home to 12,000 metalheads. I love, I actually love seeing this as it is. I love seeing the build and, you know, how it develops. It's, and the size of it is now, you know, compared to what it was when it first started. That's quite big compared to what it was last year. all offload and build, build, build. This is the calm before the storm, gentlemen, trust me. Gotta be safe, gotta be here. Uh, sorted, really. So yeah, I've just gotta make sure everything runs to time. By tomorrow, we shall be ready to start pouring and ready for Thursday, so. We have the big testing session on Thursday morning to make sure the beer is perfect quality. No. I think a gallery at a festival is a bit of a no-brainer for us. I, th I think our fans, more than probably any other, would, would really appreciate the artwork. I think when uh, Bloodstock started, people were quite nervous. It's a frightening appearance but um, we've learned over the years that they're not as bad as they look. Um, they're well behaved and everybody's used to them now. In the 90s, metal became stronger again. Um, that's when Paul came in and he established the Bloodstock Festival. In 2001, Bloodstock started as a one-day indoor festival with only 700 metalheads in attendance. I was there when they had the first meeting. It wasn't planned, it was more of an accident. He met Vince uh, through a website that he wanted to have developed and they all went to the pub one day and they were all talking about the fact that there was nowhere they could go to spend a day listening to the kind of bands that they were all into. There, were, there wasn't a festival, which is when one of them must have said, obviously, well, maybe we should do something. I heard myself say yes before I'd even considered it. That's, and that's how it was. It was just, a, you know, just like, how difficult can it be? And we were just like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> And then he had this meeting and then uh, they were all sat there and I'm thinking, oh, he's actually being quite serious about, <laughs> about doing this. And then the next thing, they've bought the assembly rooms. So we all went uh, downtown to the assembly rooms and um, booked the venue. Our bus stop merchandise store used to be here. Yeah. We had trestle tables. Really? All this was the bar area, you know, seated, so it was quite nice. So. And I had um, one of my ten foot by six foot canvases, and it was actually hung up that wall there. We used to spell the word "good stuff." In oh yeah, on, on the window. All my mates used to come along, give me a hand, you know. All hands on, first one. And then the next thing, Vince is 
booking some bands that he really likes. They still haven't got a clue about anything. It's kind of like more common sense. Okay, we need obviously a venue, we need bands, we need this, that and the other. Okay, let's have a go. That was a long trip and we're here now. We had struggled in the early days with the band, so I went to Biff and he looked at the bands and he said, you want to do it? And he all said yes, so that's how it started. Yeah, we did the first one. I think it was more or less sold out. It was the first time anybody had done something like that indoor. So it was a good gig. It was very amateur hour, if I'm brutally honest with you, when it was, when it was first happened. But for a one-day festival that, that was organised by people that, other than like the music, had no idea what they were doing, you know, pulled it off. Paul was a, a big supporter of metal music, so he invited us to play there. And that actually has been our first chance to play in the UK. We went to Derby, didn't know what to expect, and it was a fairly small venue, maybe 2,000 people. It was a convention back then, more than a festival. We came on very, very early. Rachel and I used to literally be the merch girls. Vicky and I just thought it was dead cool that they were doing this metal festival, so we said, well, what can we do? And it was just a laugh for the first couple of years. As the years have gone on, just got more and more and more and more involved. And then it started to grow and grow, and then it kind of started to burst at the seams a little bit. When my dad said in uh, 2005, we need to go outdoors, we need to make this bigger, we were like, oh crap, here he goes again. It really did get to the point where we had bigger bands asking to come and play, and we couldn't feasibly make it work in terms of getting the number of people to the indoor and really providing a festival that was financially viable. In 2005, Bloodstock became the open-air festival it is today. It was the best decision he made. It really was. It nearly broke the festival, but it was kind of either lose your house or just put everything in. It's just literally like playing roulette. It was, it was, it was that turn of a dice. Um, but no, it, it, it worked. Uh, my partner at the time, he's, um, you know, he got children and he had commitment, so you know, he felt that it was getting too much for him, so. I decided to take it on with the debt and then um, clear him, so he walked away and, and uh, I carried on. With Bloodstock growing every year, the team behind the festival had to grow as well. Paul's sort of on his own now. He's a great mastermind. He hasn't got strengths in negotiating with acts. Logistically, we had to come in on our own strengths to help. Vicky is a very, very stubborn very stubborn individual and if she wants something she will get it she'll make sure she gets it so when it came to booking the bands we said well who's going to do it and Vicky was just like oh okay I'll do it but she's a very very good personality for that because she's in a very male dominated environment and she doesn't take any shit. We sort of did our own things Rachel was brilliant with logistics she's brilliant with putting things together and accounts so it was natural for her to do that and Adam's a born salesperson, so putting him in front of sponsors was a no-brainer. I think if we weren't family, it probably wouldn't still be here because yes. the, you, you're, a, you're a lot more tolerant with your family because you have to be because you can't get rid of them. <laughs> and we all have straight, very strong personalities as well, so... Yeah. Not as strong as you two. No, we all, want, we all have to be right. Yeah. Well, I have to be right. I think if the festival wasn't there, we probably wouldn't see half as much of each other and we probably wouldn't actually appreciate and know each other as well as we actually do um, because you, you know as we all grow up we all lead separate lives separate families you just don't see people as much but we have no choice to and yeah I'd say we're incredibly close uh, and I'm really really proud of that we blow off and we scream at each other now and again but you know it's family you you, you pick the phone up the next day you say sorry and then you carry on we keep each other on each other on our toes and it does work particularly well but that's not just based on what we do is based on the team that we've developed. You know, and that team that's grown with us over the last sort of four or five years is now a very, very well-oiled machine that, that, in my mind's eye, delivers a great, a great festival each year now. 
There's this community spirit going on here. Everyone's pulling in the right direction. It's a family-run festival, and back in the day, you could feel that, and you can still feel it now. My daughter's come for the first time this year. She's 17. We've never bought us before. And she is amazed by how friendly it all is, by how everybody knows everybody. I find metal fans, some of them all, the nicest, most genuine people you could ever meet. And they're having a good time, but they're not hurting anybody. They're just about having a fun time. That's what it's all about. If a man goes down in the pit, you pull him up. And he's your buddy. And you go and buy him a beer. People think of heavy metal and they go, you know, people who don't know about heavy metal or hardcore, they go, oh, that's that kill your mother music. But really, there's a lot of positive messages and there's a lot of, you know, cool stuff in it. And if you really think about it, stuff in pop and hip hop is way sillier than anything in metal. Because the idea that people are out partying and paying thousands of dollars for vodka bottles and yeah. popping and champagne and all this stuff, that's way sillier to me than dragons and, yeah. you know, uh, the heavy metal imagery. That's the one thing that people who aren't into metal don't understand, that it's a cathartic experience. People come here, they, you know, they work crap jobs, they take crap from their bosses, you know, and this weekend you come here and you let it all out, you hang with your friends and you forget all of that. But the fact is this festival is sold not on headlines, it's sold on atmosphere. You know, it's, it's, it's a festival, the tagline is by the fans for the fans. There's no bigger metalhead here this weekend than me, you know, and, and the rest of the team, and yeah. Paul, and you know, yeah. there's no bigger metalhead. We're all one and the same. For us guys, we, we wouldn't really be where we were at all without Bloodstock Festival being behind us. Grab your horns, killing you horns. Grab your horns, grab your horns. March for, raise a call. Pull the crab on, grab your horns, grab your horns. Every time we play, we just walk away going, well, I'm almost crying. There's nowhere like it. There's nowhere like it. So welcoming as a festival. Arise, my mighty pink army. Scuttle left. Scuttle right. Attack. Paul's gamble paid off. Not one to stand by idly, he now uses the festival to pass the torch. I came up with the idea of um, uh, giving a young band somewhere to actually play the work and, and, and give them a platform. So I came up with the idea of Metal of the Masses. I brought Simon in uh, from Beholder, Simon Hall. Metal to the Masses is an annual competition open to any unsigned metal bands. All across the United Kingdom, these bands play for a chance to take the stage at Bloodstock Open Air. The Metal to the Masses thing is, is finding the best bands in each area of the UK, and it's bringing them into the new Blood stage here. And they're all hand-picked as well by Simon yeah. himself, and he, he, well, he's, I don't know how he does it. He drives, around, time, yeah, like, he drives around the country this. in his little van, sleeps in the back of his van, doing gigs, and... He's the most dedicated band finder I've ever seen. Saturday evening. Fuck all to do, so I thought I'd pop and see some friends in Bristol. Basically, venues run the events with guidance from myself and guidance from the Metal to the Masses team, and I come along at the end and basically picking a band on its merit. We don't do any sort of head count. We don't do any sort of uh, battle of the fans, if you like, because as much as it is a, a competition, the truth of the matter is there's no battle, because at the end of the day, it's about bands networking. If we don't go out there and search for these bands, you're gonna miss some golden nuggets, and some of these bands sort of, they don't last very long if you don't find them and give them uh, a platform to, 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 to play by. The band from Bristol, 2014, Metals of the Masses. Oh! So he's going to play at Bloodstock over there. In the car. Ladies and gentlemen, you're winning to 2014 Bristol. It's over. So every, every band that gets pulled into that system is looked at and run up the flagpole, basically, and if, if they're good, people will salute it. If they're not, people will walk. And, and to get the opportunity to do that for us last year was, was fucking top. People have been really supportive of us, actually. And people it's have got like... behind us. 
Bullrift Stampede is one of the many bands who have found success through the Metal to the Masses system. As a result of winning the competition, they are now often booked to play on Bloodstock's larger stages, performing for a crowd of metalheads hungry for new bands. That was the pit march! You want to find the next Metallica, Iron Maiden, you know, it has to be a, you know, who's coming up next, the young bands. So you need them to, ins need to inspire those bands, you know. So we just want to make it a little bit easier, you know, to give them a, a bit of a platform, you know. So I want to do a similar thing with young artists as well. And for me, art and music are connected, certainly heavy metal with, uh, with fantasy art. With his belief in supporting up-and-coming artists, Paul is sharing his rock and metal gallery with a selection of musically inspired individuals, offering them a platform to help showcase their work. Incidentally, Paul has helped me with my work as a guitar maker, allowing me to exhibit amongst some other reputable artists. Paul, he is such an inspiration, he's a pioneer, and he's a master. If you look at his work, he's absolutely so masterful, the detail is incredible. And um, with me personally, you know, I've struggled uh, financially. I can only thank Paul for helping me out, and it's, it's spreading. It's spreading like wildfire, and the gallery is getting bigger and bigger each year. It's a, an incredible thing. His end goal is to have a museum, you know, all-encompassing recording studios, a bar and, and music shops. You've, you've got an auditorium that you could have two, three, four, six thousand people in and, and bands playing. You know, somewhere where you could effectively call is the UK hub of music. This is his next big leap. And, you know, in 2006, when it was like, oh, crap, it's kind of that again. It's like the gallery, I think they, they did, they thought, oh, you can't do that, but I did that, and, you know, that's worked, you know. Heavy Metal the Masters, again, that was a crazy idea, but I did that, and that worked, you know, and I think that's, if you're an artist, you're creative, so you're a creative, so you need to create, you know, you need to develop things, you know, that um, other people think are insane, well, they are, you know. Putting on a festival's insane. I mean, when I actually bought um, my partner out, you know, there was a lot of money involved in that, you know, and I actually said, I put my house on, that, on the line for that. You know, you have to take risks in life, you know, that's what it's about, isn't it? Or you just go away, you know, bored and die. <laughs> you know, be who you want to be. Don't let anybody hold you back and do what you want to do. He was told in the early years of the festival, it'll never work, it'll never be what it'll be. Look at it today. I, I think of Paul and his family as, you know, the salt of England. This is what a country's about. These sort of people, and they're part of, you know, what makes the country worth living in. The question I posed to Terence Cuneo, who exhibited at the gallery, was which is you, you know, consider your best painting? And he said the next one, which some stuck with me, and I think that's right. Paul's latest painting is titled Mordor Festival. It features hundreds of faces of friends and family. Every year it's featured in the Rock and Metal Gallery as a work in progress. Festival goers can watch year by year as Paul's work on the painting continues. Mordor Festival has no completion date.